Well, good morning and a very special welcome to anyone who may be visiting with us. First Peter, we are studying through, and the Lord has been meeting us in some very special ways, and we're, we're beholding His glory, and I just see so many saints being encouraged in the Word of God, so we are grateful to God for the way He's meeting us in this epistle. We have been up in the Everest of doctrine and truth, and now we're kind of narrowing in last week and this week on understanding trials and how God uses them in the life of a believer, how, how they fit into the amazing truths and realities that we've been studying for in these first five verses, how the glories of the gospel and suffering are our marriage made in heaven and what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. The, the theme of this epistle, as I've been saying, is how do I go into the furnace and not come out as a burnt cinder, but how do I come out as refined gold? How, how does that happen? Pure gold. And that is what we are seeking as a church, and we're in the heart of that possibility this morning. We're going to look right into how that can happen. And so I just want to read a passage, and then we will pray, and we will take up the study of God's Word. But I just, in, in way of introduction, I just want you to listen to these words of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 13, verse 3, Jesus spoke many things to, the, to them in parables, saying this, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up, and others fell upon the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, and because they had no depth of soil, but when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear what Jesus says. And then in a few verses later, Jesus will interpret that parable. He said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and just snatches it away, what has been sown in his heart. This is the one whom seed was sown beside the road. And the one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he just falls away. And, that, and that's what we're fighting for in Peter to not be. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word. And the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. But on the one whom seed was sown, this is the seed that we've been studying that causes you to be born again. Uh, that's good soil. God has prepared the heart. This is the man who hears the word, he understands it, and he indeed bears fruit, and he brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So I pray this morning that that, that is what I'll, we'll see at Southside Bible Church, is that we would understand this gospel uh, it would be in our hearts, and the fruit that would come forth would be 160, 30-fold in your life. And I, I don't want anyone to have the, the trials come in and, and scorch you, and, and you die, and you never really had a true faith. So we're, we're studying how do you go in the furnace, and how will you come out as pure gold building, you know, pr producing 160, 30-fold of fruit. So let's go to our God and ask that that is what he would do in our very midst and that he would teach us well in the word of God this morning. Father, we come before you and we, we are looking at such a beautiful area of the Christian life and understanding the trials that you bring into them. And so God, I pray again that you will open up this word and you will teach us your thoughts about trials, that you would give us wisdom from above. God, that there would be a way to um, suffer and hurt and have exceedingly great joy at the same time. And so, God, only you could do that. And so we're looking to you to teach us, to comprehend it, and then we're looking to you for the grace to be able to do that. I pray that there would be no one in here, Lord, who uh, has come with a wrong understanding of Christianity. And when the, when the trials come and the squeezings, Lord, that they would walk away and chuck this because they didn't sign up for that. I pray that every heart in here knows you and that every heart uh, will endure whatever furnace you would ever place us into. 
And so, God, I, I pray, um, do mighty things in your midst this morning through the word of God. We pray that when I finish, that your glory would be on display and all of us would behold it and adore it and worship. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus, our sweet Savior, we do pray. Amen. First Peter. Peter's brought us to the very heart of the gospel. We've been studying that for weeks now, and uh, we're looking at suffering. And he says when you're in suffering, you need to look up, you need to look past, you need to look through what you're facing. You need to look, what Peter said, at what God has done in eternity past in your election to eternity future of your inheritance that he has laid up for you. So look what he's done. What he's doing right now in your life is what he's teaching us and what he will do in coming glory. We have to fight. Uh, joy is something that it's a command. It's of the will. I set my will to rejoice. So I have to look at these truths. I've got to quit looking at the truth trial and what it's doing and how much it hurts, and I've got to come back and gaze again at these realities to get, bring back exceedingly abundant joy in the midst of all that you're facing. We have been born again to a living hope. God has taken dead corpses and raised us, and now we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's reserved for you in heaven. It's imperishable, it's undefiled, it will not fade away, it's safer than Fort Knox. Your inheritance is protected by God. And in verse 5, what we were looking at for two weeks is, the, is this verse that he says, you're kept then by the power of God through faith. So you're saved, we've got this inheritance, and what we're learning is the weak link is from now till then. If it's up to me, I'm not gonna make it to my inheritance. I love that God's protecting it, but that doesn't do me any good because my faith is weak. And so what God has said is, I've given you a faith. That faith was a gift from God, and I will nurture it and refine it and preserve it. That faith will not fail, just like Peter's. He fell, but Jesus said, I prayed that your faith will not fail, and when you turn, strengthen your brothers again. Your faith is indestructible because it's from God and it's protected by God. So the way he's protecting you is not just putting this little hedge and making you all the way to glory and nothing will touch you. He's saying everything will touch you that I allow, but the way I'm protecting you is through faith. The way I will bring you to glory will be through the instrument of your faith. That is how I protect my children. So if faith is the key instrument then that God uses to protect us, he needs to grow it. He needs to purify it <clears throat> to make sure that, it, that we will never let go of Jesus Christ. We need a faith that will endure. And that is the only kind of faith that God gives. That is true saving faith. It will make it to the end when one day my faith shall be sight. And so child of God, I don't know how to say it any clearer, you are safe. You are in the hands of God. You are protected by the power of God. And as Peter found out, your faith may falter, but it will not ultimately fail because Jesus prays that your faith will not fail. And Jesus' prayers are always effectual. Therefore, we need our faith purified. Trials are God's way of protecting us. Do you get that? Trials are not to destroy us. God is not dunking you this morning to make you miserable. This is the love of God, hand-picked trials that I will bring into your life to protect you, to gird your faith, to strengthen it, to purify it so that you will make it to the very end and get this inheritance that I have reserved and died for and accomplished and secured for you. Peter Right now, what we're studying then in verses 6 through 9 um, is that he'll give us seven truths to understand then and endure suffering on our way to glory. And last week in verse 6, we got to look at four of them, and I told you it may vary, but we are sticking with seven, seven truths. So let's review from last week, and I'll do it quickly. In verse 6, we started to look then, why trials? And, and in verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice. So what is this? This is the salvation of verses 1 through 5, that God did set his love on you before he created this universe. God loved you. His son came 
And he redeemed you. He went on a cross. He lived the life you should have. He died the death that you deserved. And now he's been raised from the dead. And now in time and space, the Spirit has brought you to a living faith. He caused you to repent and see the glory of Christ and believe in him. You were born again to a living hope. And you have an inheritance that no one can take away. And you're protected by the power of God. In that, you just rejoice. There is joy that because those are eternal, unchanging truths, your joy can always be fixed on that no matter what you're facing this morning. It, it's unchanging. And that's where you find your joy. I fight to put my mind back there. In that, you greatly rejoice. Secondly, even though now for a little while, there's a season of suffering, and sometimes it's on this earth, it can be temporal, it can be quick, and other times it can be your whole life. And what we looked at is a little while is in light of eternity. And whatever these little dots of life that we live, we get the privilege to suffer for King Jesus. This is the only time that we get the chance to suffer and still believe and love Jesus Christ. And so it's a little while. If you will look at eternity for how long you got to suffer on this earth, whatever you're enduring this morning, it's going to be swallowed up by eternity. And when you've been there a million years, you have no less days to enjoy God than when you first begun. Fight for eternality. Fight in the midst when it feels like it's been three years. It's been 30 years. I can't endure it any longer. It's just a little while. It's a little while compared to what's laid up for you and what's coming into your life. Thirdly, God says, if necessary, and we wrestled, is that necessary to you or necessary to God? And it's not you. God isn't going to uh, come to you and say, is it necessary for me to put you in a trial? Is it necessary to keep you in the furnace? This is if it's necessary by infinite wisdom, a father who loves you, who will only do what is good for you. It's necessary. It's necessary to God to put you in a furnace so that your faith will be purified and it will make it to the end. So when you're questioning and being mad or whatever you're struggling with God, it's necessary, and he's saying it's necessary for me to protect you in this way. Your faith needs to be purified. It needs to be strengthened in this area if you're going to make it for my inheritance. I'm protecting you by sticking you in a furnace. That's the love of God in protecting you. So when we curse them and push them off and hate them, they're the very gift of God to make sure you make it to the very end in faith. That will change your life if you can get your arms around if necessary. Fourthly, we looked at that you've been distressed by various trials. And so I don't want you to miss that these trials hurt. You've been squeezed. You've been distressed. Uh, the, 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 the burdens of trials and how hard and how heavy. I, I don't, I'm not saying walk around every time you're hurting. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. This feels great. Praise God. You know, don't be a fake phony. This is giving you permission that you're human and you're being distressed and they hurt, they're hard, they're difficult, and we come together and when one weeps, we all weep because they're hard. They're difficult and it's okay that it hurts and it's difficult. It's why God's even using it in your life. So don't be Stoics. Don't fake it. Come, I'm dying. Help me. Help me reach out to the person next to you. I, I've, I'm distressed by various trials. And yet we saw that distressed was in a present tense. You're being distressed, and in the present tense is you're rejoicing in these things. So we're, we're just this paradox. People can't understand us. We, we feel pain and it hurts, and it's hard, and I'm rejoicing all rolled into one because of these realities that this world didn't give me and the world can't take it away. I, I can't quit rejoicing because I know how hard this is, is purifying me for that eternal inheritance. So we have the ability, guys, to do both to, at the same time, to be distressed and to rejoice in these things. So both these statements are in the present tense. So now, that's review. That was, that was quick. Thank you. Um, fifth, the fifth way of an understanding so that we can endure suffering on our way to glory is I'm going to call it dokimatsu. Dokimatsu is in verse 7, and that's a Greek word, one of the sweetest Greek words in the Bible. Not the sweetest. There's other ones like Christ, grace, redemption, a lot of others. But for trials, it is an amazing word. So look with me in verse 7, and we'll learn about dokimatsu. 
<coughs> verse 7, that the proof, there's dokimazo, that the dokimazo of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is a beautiful analogy that Peter pulls out here. He's going to compare our faith, what we're studying, being tested by trials to that of, of, be, of gold being refined in a furnace to, to make pure gold. And so in this analogy, the, the fire is a trial. The gold that goes in that fire is your faith. And the gold that comes out of the fire, the purified gold, is tested faith. And so let me try and help you understand then what Peter is saying. This was a very common process in Peter's day, and it's, uh, it's done in ours as well, how we temper metals. And so what you have here is you have a goldsmith, and he would, he would take the gold, and he would put it in a very hot fire or a furnace, and in the fire, the gold uh, it could not be ultimately destroyed. But what would happen for the, the right amount of heat for the right amount of time, the impurities that were in that gold will come to the top, and they will boil out of the gold. They'll, they'll, they'll boil up. And then you, you would take the gold, and you would scrape off the impurities that the heat had brought to the surface. This is known as adokimas, the, the, the impure parts that came up. Scrape it off. Get it off the, the purified gold. And what you would have then is dokimas. Adokimas is scraped off. Dokimas is what is left, and this is this approved gold. Gold that was purer than when it went into the furnace. And so please don't miss this. It would be hard because it's such a good illustration. It's so clear and beautiful. I think God made sheep for Psalm 23, and I think he made metal for this very reason so we could picture one of the most beautiful understandings of why God brings trials. Your faith is that God is going to protect you by, it, it has a dokimos in it. So every one of you this morning has some adokimos in your faith, and that means impurities. It's still faith. It just isn't pure, refined, beautiful gold yet. Does that make sense? You are born again. Your first breath is this newfound faith that God has given to you. It's not mature it's not refined, purified faith yet. It's a child's faith. And now you need the hand of the master, our sovereign God, to strengthen and make it deeper and give some grit to it. And so what is the adokimos? The adokimos are things that we trust in and love more than Jesus Christ. It could be your job. My, 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 my goal is to just climb the ladder in everything about my life. I put in more time. I deny my family. I deny my church trying to climb the corporate ladder. And I think that if I get to the vice president, then everything in my life will make me happy. And you've got adokimos in your faith. You might believe that it's a spouse. If I could just find the right spouse, everything would be great. If I could just get body beautiful, everything would be good for me. My 401k is my security and hope. Adokimos is unbelief. It's the man who says, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's the adokimos that's still in every one of our hearts. I believe this, but help my unbelief. This remaining flesh that is continuing to doubt and not believe the promises of God, that stuff has to get boiled out of your heart. It's got to go. And longing for ease, inner sins of pride and self and impatience and jealousy, love of money, love of this present world. There are a million things that are adokimos in your heart. And we all have this in our hearts. And in the midst of this, we have a new heart. God has given us a new one, and we have faith. So we need God to purify out all of this junk that still remains. All of this unbelief that fights against faith. I think every one of you, if I could give you a wish, you would say, I wish I could get rid of the unbelief in my life. I wish the parts that I don't believe would be boiled off. I'm telling you, this is God's answer to that cry and to that prayer. I, I want that out. God, I hate it in my life, but could you get rid of it by me sitting on a beach with a sunset in prosperity? I just want to grow, but not that way. 
God says the way that I'm going to purify your faith is I'm going to boil it out. I'm going to boil out the impurities. It doesn't come by sunsets. It isn't going to get there by ease. I'm going to boil this stuff out by putting you in situations that you can't handle in your own strength. And I'm going to do it by fire, if, if necessary. If necessary, he will pick the exact trial that you need. Omniscience is an amazing thing. And he will pick how long and how intense. And it will always be exactly what you needed, whether you think so or not. So in goes your faith. It's a fire, and it's grieved, and it's really, really hard. But in that fire, the hardness of it is going to do something amazing to your faith. And I just want to note in Hebrews 12, it says, In trials they're not joyful but sorrowful. Afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So if you're right in the middle of them, I want you to know that it is joyful. It's not joyful. It's sorrowful. It's hard. But what it's going to produce afterwards is going to be beautiful as we keep enduring. So the fire will boil off the impurities in your faith. God will take his instrument and he'll scrape it out of your life. And what will come out of the fire will be a faith that loves him more and trusts him more. And there's less unbelief than there was before. And as a pastor, I, I've watched this again and again in, in all of your lives. And I, it's beautiful. It's hard to watch. It's beautiful, though, what it's producing. And I, I love some of the gold that's shining in this room this morning. So what is dokimos? What is this approved gold? What is the approved faith look like? Well, a couple of things that I know of for sure is what comes out of that fire is humility. There's a humility when you come out that there's more self-knowledge. I kind of thought I was up here and now I know I'm here. And there, there's just a hu humiliation that comes in to your life and there, there's more understanding of God. And I, I heard about you with my ears, but now, now I see you. And, and so you come out of these trials and the approved goal is there's humility one of those beautiful graces that come out of trials. One, another thing that comes out, this pure gold, is your idols have been smashed. So when we begin to think something else is more satisfying than God, something we give more of our heart and our time and our energies to, God will take them and smash them in the furnace. And when you come out, I'm holding something better now. I'm beholding the living God. Another purified thing that comes out in this gold is that of love. There's an intimacy of God's love and presence like nothing else. It's, it's beautiful when you come out. I remember when I used to discipline my children. Uh, after I would discipline them, that my, I remember they used to go, restoration? You know, little two-year-olds, restoration? You know, they, they loved uh, being reconciled and being near to their daddy after that discipline. And when God disciplines us and takes us in the furnace, there, there's just kind of this nearness of Abba, Daddy, greater love, greater closeness, there's a beauty uh, that that produces in the furnace. The other one is wisdom and compassion. Uh, you come out now and you have the ability, as Paul said in Corinthians now, to help other people in the fire. You have a unique understanding of how you got through the furnace, what you learned, and now you care about other people and what they're facing, and you come with more humility, more compassion, you have some wisdom to impart to, how, to help them. And so there, there's a beauty, there's a, a refined faith that comes out with more wisdom and compassion. And, and those are just a few of the dokimos that comes out of the fire. So guys, the furnace is necessary if we will make it to the end in faith. If there's no furnace, your, your flesh will overgrow your heart and, and you'll just chuck it. All hell is going to be thrown against us in this journey we're going to have temptations from within and temptations from without. You're going to have assaults and solicitations by the enemy. And our worst enemy of sin within, remaining flesh, will fight and battle. And the love of God is that he disciplines all whom he receives as sons. That is the love of God. And I want you to get this last thought. that The goldsmith would take that gold and stick it in there. And then he would take it and he would inspect it to see if there were impurities and if it needed more. And if there were, he just kept sticking it in again and again and again. And he would keep doing this process 
until he could finally look at the gold and see his own reflection. And, and when he could see his own reflection in the gold, it was purified. And so God is going to keep dipping you again and again until he looks at you and he sees his own reflection. And so praise God that he's purifying you to reflect his radiant son. So our merciful father will stick us in the furnace until he looks at us and sees that own reflection. Isn't that beautiful that God would refine faith of his children? I heard Pastor John MacArthur, uh, he said, I used to struggle with assurance when I was younger. I had some horrible battles fighting with, am I a believer or not? Am I really saved? And he says, I don't anymore at all. And he said, the reason I don't is because I have endured so many trials. So many trials have come into my life, and what's come out is purified faith, more love to Him, wisdom, all the things that I have learned, I have not walked away. And so he says, I love Him more than I've ever loved Him. And so I have full assurance, I, I don't even doubt or struggle anymore because I have been tried and tested, and I'm still loving Him, following Him, amen. So perseverance is huge for your assurance. The devil will see to it that you doubt. Lloyd-Jones said that. He doesn't want you to live in the fullness of the hope that we've been studying. So we've been looking at this beautiful hope and certainty of it, and the devil hates for you to love that, find security in it, and live for it. He doesn't want you to be eternal-minded and be done with lesser things. He wants you to live for lesser things. And so he will always be fighting against your hope. And in this, we learn, I've persevered. He wants you to live in fear that you will die and be deceived and cast into the pit of hell. And so I want to ask you, have you asked yourself this question? How have you responded to the many trials that have come into your life? And I don't mean immediately, but I mean afterwards. Do you love him? Do you trust him more? Do you understand his ways more? Have you been humbled? Are you more surrendered? Then you have great grounds to rejoice this morning that your faith was tried and tested and it was approved. Let that do something to your heart this morning. Your faith has been proven. And so I didn't cause you, it didn't cause you to hate him or to be done with God or to walk away. When your idol was smashed, you either hate what smashed it or you end up thanking God for sticking you in the furnace and boiling off something that you were trusting in more than God. So get that. The fact that I have been at this now for more than 30 years, much has been thrown at me since I became a believer in Christ, and I love him more today than when I started. I, I had puppy love at the beginning, and it's matured into an understanding of who he really is and how he really acts and who I really am and who Christ is. That is because God has given me a faith, and he's maturing it. He's protecting me from myself for an inheritance that is laid up for me, and I pray that that is every one of your testimony here this morning. I heard a good illustration a few weeks back about the purpose of the furnace, and it's about a lumberjack. And there's a lumberjack, and he's doing what lumberjacks do. He's cutting down trees in the forest, and he looks up, and he sees in the tree there's a mother bird making a nest in the tree of the next one that he's going to cut down. And so he takes his axe and he, he pounded that tree until the bird flew over to another tree and started making his nest in that one. But that was going to, uh, he, he, that was going to be the next tree that he was going to cut down. And so he would, he would go and he'd hit that thing again and he just kept following this bird, banging tree after tree with his axe to get the bird to move over. And the bird is probably thinking to himself, why is this man persecuting me? He just won't leave me alone. I hear that all the time. He just keeps making me leave one comfortable tree after another. And then finally the bird went up to a high rock where the lumberjack left him alone and he made his nest there and was extremely happy. And so my point, besides being a cute little story, is that God will cut down every tree that you try to make home until you build your nest in him under the shadow of his wings. And so he will keep at it until you just find your complete rest under his wing. So sweet. I like that better than the Broncos last week. 
Sixthly, there's more. If you'll look with me in verse 7, there's a, what's called a henna clause, which is the purpose. Why would he stick us in a furnace? It says that you, and for the purpose, that you might be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what's, what's the purpose of a preserved faith, of a purified faith? It's going somewhere. It's going to the great day of the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a day coming when he's going to be revealed in all of his glory. We, his bride, will be presented to him spotless and blameless and beautiful. And this faith really will now be sight. And what we're going to realize is it didn't, fa- it didn't fail. It, it got me to the very end. And now I'm going to enjoy the wedding supper with the Lamb. It was God's means to protect me for that day. It worked. It got me there. I'm going to, I'm going to make it to the end. How many, how many things have you set out to do that you never got there? This, by God's grace, it's going to bring you to an end. This works. It's God's faith. It's going to bring you to that day. And now I'm going to be standing in my inheritance. And we don't spend a bunch of time then patting ourselves on the back bragging about, man, did I have amazing faith. You sh- I- I'm amazed at how I made it to the end. No one will do that. Everyone's going to be just giving God glory, praise, and honor for all of eternity. Because we know our faith was given and preserved and purified by the one, and we're going to praise him. And he'll get all the glory. We'll scribe it all to him. To him be the glory both now and forever. We'll never get tired of singing that and worshiping and praising him that he did this for us. Honor the one God over all who has reversed the curse and has won the victory. And again, we'll throw our crowns down at his feet and just say to him, be praise, glory, and honor. Doesn't that help you in thinking about trials? There, there's an end in sight. If it was just suffering and getting through it, what, what's the use just suffering for the sake of suffering. But it's unto a, an amazing climax in the history of this world. And I want to be there so bad. And it will take a furnace for this heart and the adokimos that's in it to be boiled out. And on that day when my preserved faith makes it to that last day, I'm, I'm going to praise him. And I'm going to worship him forever. So I just want you to know suffering saint, it's going to end in something really, really good. The, the, the cost is so much less than the reward. So be reminded of it's worth enduring and persevering in whatever you're facing this morning because this, this faith will bring you to something that is better than uh, anyone could ever give words to. Amen? Amen. And last thing to help us in our suffering and our endurance is in verses 8 through 9 is this love and trust and joy connection that we're going to see in these last verses So Peter says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you don't see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And so this is something that is so beautiful about faith is is right now we don't see Jesus. Right now we don't see him, but listen to this, we love him. I don't see him, but I believe in him. I can't see him, but I have a joy inexpressible in him. And so is there anyone you love that you have never seen? I, just, I don't have anyone like that. I just love this person passionately, but I've never seen him. This is so beautiful. This is what faith can do. This is what purified faith does. Trials deepen and refine these realities. These fruits come out of the furnace. Refined faith will do this to us. It will give us belief and joy and love to him. Sometimes you see these new couples and and there's just this little puppy love. They're they're almost a riot to watch. I won't mention names. So then trials come and they hit and and you see the relationship and and they've got to fight and they've got to journey through these things and what happens, it matures into a deeper and more mature love. And that is what happens to us by fire. It deepens our love. He was our rescue. He came in the fire with me. 
There were other things that I loved more than him. Now I love him supremely. It's gone. He helped me and he did not leave me. I've had so many people leave me and walk away, but Jesus Christ never will and he never did. There's so, my faith is purified and so is my love. And so the more I see and believe, the more I love the supreme object of my affections, Jesus Christ. And so I just want to do a real quick bird's eye look at this passage because we're about out of time. Uh, just a couple of the components. I was listening to John Piper and he drew out these three points I want to borrow from him. He said, uh, the first point, loving Christ. Though you don't see him, you love him. This is experiencing Christ as precious. In 1 Peter 2, he says he's a precious cornerstone to us. There's a beauty to him. He's lovely. He's glorious. So uh, we see him as precious in all of his character, in all of his actions on our behalf. So we look at Christ, who he is, what he has done. He's precious. My heart is drawn out to him. I love him. I love Christ. And then faith is trusting Christ. It's experiencing Christ then as reliable. Love is experiencing him as precious. Trust is experiencing that he is reliable. Uh, for all of his promises, every promise that he has made, he's reliable. He's the only person on this earth that I can guarantee you is reliable to keep his promises. In all of his counsels, he can be trusted. When he counsels you about sex, money, forgiveness, love, all of these things, he can be trusted. I trust him that he's telling me the right way to live and the right way to find intimacy and blessing with him. And so there is a trust because God is reliable. Love, he's precious. Trust, faith is because this God is reliable. And joy is the deep good feelings so it's more than happiness. It's this deep in good feelings in loving him and believing in him. So as I believe in Christ and I love him, the fruit of that is joy. It, it just brings out joy. That's Christianity in a nutshell. It's not nodding to a doctrinal statement. I've had more people tell me the way I know I'm a Christian, I believe in the 1689 Confession. I believe in the Westminster Confession. I know every bit of it. I can quote it. That's how I know I'm a Christian. No, it isn't. The devils know the exact same confessions. It's because we love him and we trust him and we have joy in him. You get this and the rest of this book tells you how you live and it's going to take care of itself. Peter says there's an inner reality of these truths that we've looked at and they take your heart away, and they give you faith, and they produce joy, and there's a, a life that will come out of those realities. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He didn't say keeping my commandments is love. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Too many have missed this. Christianity to them is a religion that they take up and they just follow a few moral standards, and they go to church, and all it is is these external things. And I'm telling you, when you stand before God, he's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. This is about an intimate relationship with Christ. I, I, I love him. I believe in him. And I have a joy in this Christ. That is what this gospel does to a heart. How do you know if you're a Christian? Because devils believe and I'll tell you as clearly as I know this morning is you love him. Do you love him even if he put you in a furnace? Do you love this sweet Christ here this morning as you sit? I'm not asking if you're religious. Do you love him? Boils it all right down to the essence of Christianity. Though we do not see him, we love him. That is what God does in our hearts. It's in the present tense. We're loving him. And it's the word agapa, agape, agapao, is that I just, all I do is I, it's not about me anymore. I just love him for who he is. And I just look and who he is and what he's done. I have agape. I will deny and sacrifice. I'll take up my cross and die and follow this one the rest of my life. I have agapao 
for this Christ. Trials come and hurt, but what comes out is a deeper love that's been more refined and you believe. You believe in them because you experience them even deeper in the furnace. When I come out of a trial, my faith doesn't even struggle at all. It's just, oh, I believe. I know him. I'm walking with him. I believe everything he says. You believe. And so here's my question in closing. Is, listen, there's got to be a reason Peter says something twice. I, I think he only needs to say it once, and I think it's so we won't miss it. And so here this morning, as Peter says twice, we don't see him now. Uh, two times, we don't see him now, and though we don't see him, I, I think that's really important because none of us here this morning have seen him. Raise your hand if you've seen him with your eyes. I'm going to kick you out. <laughs> you have, you're dead. You're lying. Lazarus, get out of here. Yet, we love him, and we believe in him. Isn't that amazing? I've never seen him, and I love him. What would you say to your kid if he kept coming home talking about this girl that he's in love with? He just, every day he's singing, skipping, talking about her, and you said, have you seen her? Nope, I've never seen her. I just love her. You'd be like, get the shrink. <laughs> Something's wrong with this kid. So what can explain all the crazies here this morning, I mean, just look at us. We're hopelessly in love with Jesus Christ. We sing about him, and I had so much joy today, just, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. To preach about him is so pleasurable. To talk about him all week. To spend intimate time with him in communion daily. I hope all of you are doing that. And we have never seen this Christ with our eyes. It's crazy. And yet here's the gospel. I believe that seeing Jesus with our heart is even better than seeing him with our eyes. And I'm going to try to explain that. And so I want you to see we've never seen him, but we love him. We, we, we are aliens. We don't make sense because every one of you know what I'm talking about. I love him. And I've never seen Christ. I love this. Listen to what God said. Uh, Nick preached this once. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He, he said, let there be light in Genesis, and he said it to you at salvation when you were born again to a living hope. He turned on the light. He said, let there be light, and it's shown into our hearts, and we saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I saw it. I was there when he put the ring on my finger. I, I've seen the beauty of Jesus Christ. He flipped on the lights, and I love him even though I don't see him. And so all we have now is a Bible. Yet in the Gospels, we see him better than those who saw him when he walked upon the earth. In the Gospels, we are brought into the inner circle. Those, little, those three apostles who are in the inner circle, I get to go in with them. I'm brought into Gethsemane where he wrestled with God and sweat drops of blood. I get to come right into the garden. I get to sit front row while he's being tried. I stand as he's crucified, and I hear the seven sayings on the cross. I watch him buried. I come with Mary to an empty tomb. And we get the context of everything that he said there explained. The parables he explained deeper to us so that we will not be hearing without understanding. We can understand. We get to hear his whole sermons. And no babies crying or nothing. You, just, you can hear every word that was said. We get to go with him. To the tomb of, sorry about that, I love babies, keep your baby in here. That was, that was good timing. So we get to go with him to the tomb of Lazarus and watch him say, Lazarus, come forth, and a dead man got up and walked out of a tomb. We get to watch him love mankind like no other, honor women, love children, weep over Jerusalem, confound the Pharisees. I'm telling you right now, the gospels are better than being there. And we have the Holy Spirit illuminating them, illuminating them to our hearts. And so I've never seen him, but I love him. I believe in him. The Spirit of God has shown me the glory of, of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And as we read and study, though we've never seen him with our eyes, the eyes of our hearts see him. 
and we love Christ. And I don't see him now, but I believe in him. And what I'm finding is a joy inexpressible as I behold the beauty of Christ. And this is so good, I just, I can't find words to describe it. It's inexpressible what we're seeing and experiencing in the face of Christ. On anniversaries every so often, I try to write my wife a little note to tell her what she means to me, and I, I can never find the words to express the fullness of what that sweet little treasure has meant to me on this journey to glory. What a privilege it's been to, to lock shields with Laura and to journey together, and it's, it's almost frustrating to try to get the words to share what she means to this heart of mine. And, and when I read this word, and I just see Christ in all of his beauty, I just can't find words to express it in, in prayer or in sharing, just to express what he means to me. The joy that he brings to my heart, it's inexpressible. You can't even find words. I've had some of you clumsily try to tell me the, the glory and the beauty of what you're seeing in the face of Christ. And I just want to say, here's 10 more languages to try to share what you're trying to say. That you just, you, it's inexpressible, the joy of what we have in Christ. So even in preaching and teaching, I find myself looking for words to describe the joy that I have seen in his face. And I love him. And I believe in him. And that is what trials do, my friends. That they purify this love and they purify this faith. And they bring out a joy inexpressible of what these trials accomplish and do in our lives. So my conclusion in verse 9, I think I've said my conclusion a few times. This really is, I, I mean, there's only like this much left in my notes. So in verse 9, obtaining then as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This faith has an outcome of it, tried and purified and tested in this life. It has a finish line. In verse 4, it has this inheritance that God's laid up. And in verse 9, it's, it's the salvation of your souls souls. And so by the mercy of God, you've been born again and you were given a faith that has a hope. And this faith is protected by the power of God through faith. And it can't be overthrown. It can't be destroyed. The fires that come upon it strengthen it and purify it. Thus it is a faith with an undying love for the unseen Christ. It's a faith that the love you have for Jesus can never be squelched or burned out. It can only be purified and refined. It's a faith then that will obtain the salvation of your souls. Does this give you joy inexpressible? <laughs> I pray that it does. This is too good to be true, and yet God has said it. And so praise God that we're recipients of a grace like this. No lemon-sucking Christians. Just rejoice and inexpressible with what God has given to us. Let's pray. Father, this is so good. And I, we do, we pray for words. It's inexpressible, the joy that we have because of this Christ whom we have met, whom we have been married to, whom we see with our eyes of our heart. Oh God, thank you in these gospels that we get a walk with Christ and see all that he said and did and taught. We get to see him make atonement for our sin. God, I thank you for the beauties of Christ. I thank you that you are purifying our faith so that we get the outcome, the salvation of our souls. God, thank you that you don't leave us to ourselves. We, we love you for the way you've worked in our lives, and we trust you for the future, for the way you will work in our lives. God, take away all fear from your people this morning. They are encompassed in eternal love that can never be broken, not even by their own uh, unbelief. God, encourage their hearts this morning and let them feel just a little bit of this inexpressible joy of a God who has loved us this way in Christ. Father, I thank you, and it's in this sweet name that we pray. Amen.